Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to talk about help desk security. The enterprise help desk has long been a favorite target for attackers who are trying to seek some social, some sort of social engineering attack vector or scheme as a way to get into an organization's network or defenses. And that threat usually comes from the fact that most help desk technicians or staff members have access to highly sensitive information or privileges within that organization. And I know that most organizations like to think that their employees are trustworthy, but there have been instances where a rogue help desk technician has used the organization's data for personal gain. And just the fact that help desk technicians have access to sensitive privileges and information, the amount of harm that they could do if they themselves were had bad intentions or were compromised from a digital standpoint is concerning. So we'll start off with just the buzzword zero trust, which always assumes that you're implementing least privileged access and nobody has access to anything without first authenticating or making sure that they have supposed to have access to that particular resource. Limiting a help desk members permissions or their exposure to sensitive data or privileges can impede that the, the way that they can do their job. And so a lot of times it's really hard to prevent them from having certain access. For example, password resets is a big one that most help desk personnel have access to. A lot of organizations even have local admin. So hopefully you're not using a shared administrator credential or maybe you're using LAPS and the help desk member then has access to the, the encryption keys or the administrator, um, the administrator credentials, all of that is sensitive. And that's an example of what kind of privileges most organizations give their help desk folks, right? So trying to bring a zero trust model to help desk personnel, you usually have to find an alternative way to support that zero trust journey, so to speak, to limit and make sure that the help desk member can't cause as much harm if their access or their intent is to do such, right? So I think the first thing that we'll talk about is self-service password reset. A lot of organizations are still manually resetting the passwords, putting the ball into the employee's court and implementing self-service password reset is not only good for security, but it's also a huge cost saving measure. There was a study done by Gartner where it estimates the number of password tickets consumes about 31 to 40% of a help desk members time. You can do the math yourself, figure out how much a help desk person is paid and then how many tickets are coming in, how much time the person spends on those tickets and do the analysis yourself on how much that particular exercise costs your company. And it's probably not an insignificant amount. And so I think just implementing self-service password reset and taking that ability or at least reducing it not 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 necessarily 
eliminating the ability for a help desk person to reset passwords, but just eliminating the number of password resets that come through. And that way, when someone actually calls through and requests a password reset, now you have a little bit more time to scrutinize that request because it doesn't happen that often. If it's every minute you're getting a call to reset a password, well, you don't have time to scrutinize every single one of those requests. But if it's only once a day, yeah, then we're maybe going to take a little bit more scrutiny, find out who it is, and ask some more clarifying questions. So I think there's always going to be some sort of manual reset because maybe some people have issues resetting their password through the self-service password method. But just reducing the burden on the help desk to be less busy, right, with the number of requests that are coming through. To use an analogy that our listeners are probably familiar with, there's a lot of conversation around the sock and trying to reduce the noise in the sock, trying to reduce the repetition of the sock. And we talk about how it's hard to retain sock analysts when they're drowning in alerts that are low fidelity or, or don't have any real meaning. And it's hard to retain sock analysts when the work is so repetitive. Help does same thing. Very, very similar, really, at the end of the day, in terms of if I do this same menial task day after day, that literally can be done by a machine because that's what SSPR is. And that's the majority of my time. It's going to limit our ability to attract and retain talent for help desk. And exactly as you said, Andy, when I am drowning in alerts or I'm drowning in tickets, my goal is to just get through them as fast as I can. And I may not scrutinize them as much if I get higher fidelity alerts for the SOC or think of it as this way, higher fidelity tickets for the help desk where the tickets are more meaningful. They're more challenging. They stimulate my brain more. I'm going to apply a higher level of concentration and focus and scrutiny to those calls. So I think you're spot on. This is SSPR is the biggest no brainer in it. It is cost positive. It will pay for itself just by implementing it because almost every organization, they have the number, they know it off the top of their head. And my uh, two employers ago now, I remember we were purchasing what was Azure AD with self-service password reset. And we, the assumption was it would pay for the majority of the EMS suite at the time for Microsoft, because we knew per call cost us this much dollars per call and X number of calls per month are password resets. Therefore, if we can cut those by 90%, we save X amount of money and it was basically the cost of buying it. So again, and then you get all those other ancillary benefits you've described along the way. So this is the the biggest no brainer if you don't have a great SSPR solution and there are there are several, um, you need to do it. You know, it's a little bit of a, uh, just kind of a note for the Microsoft solution. Uh, with that's included with Azure AD Premium. One of the benefits of that is you can integrate it with the login screen for Windows. So you can make it that a user is at the login screen for Windows 10 or Windows 11. Oh, I don't know my password. They can actually reset it right then and there from the login screen. So that's super helpful as well because that's probably a place a lot of users wind up when they don't know their passwords. So that's, that's a cool feature as well. But I kind of love that first call out there. And, and I think that's a good analogy to the sock to help our, our listeners kind of think of how to relate that to your work and why there's value in doing this and why it helps. And the other thing I want to say too, is as technologists, we get so wound around the axle trying to solve things with technology and we underestimate the power of social engineering and how effective that can be. Good social engineering against somebody who is already on the phone all day and has administrative privilege is an extremely, extremely attractive target. And I always think back to there's uh, XKCD, that great kind of nerdy comic. They have the classic one that gets pulled out over and over again because it's so good where there's two attackers who had stolen somebody's laptop and they're talking about it and how they're going to break into it and blast it's encrypted with 4,096 bit RSA. We're doomed. And and then it says, what would actually happen? Uh, his password his laptop's encrypted here. Drug him and hit him with this wrench till he tells us the password, right? 
Like we love to think of technology as the way to solve everything. But as long as there's that human element, that squishy element, that unshielded, unarmored element, that's the easiest way in. Why go to all the work of breaking through somebody's password if I can fish them and they'll tell it to me, right? Like same sort of thing with phishing. Like people get hung up around, we need all this complexity so people can't crack our passwords and do rainbow tables and this and that. It's like, dude, I'm just going to ask a hundred of your employees and 10 of them will tell me anyway. Like, so the, the point I'm making here is as we go through this conversation, I really want to land with our listeners that although this is not always a technology focused conversation, there's a human element to it understand just how much attack surface there is here and how risky it is. And that's not to say even, you know, we talked about like the insider risk scenario where you have a rogue help desk agent. That's, that's a possibility. The other one is honestly, they're just tricked by a really sophisticated social engineer. And so we protect ourselves from both angles, right? Whether they are malicious or whether they themselves have been fooled, we need protecting, but I just, really want to emphasize that here is that human risks. And and I think most security practitioners get that, by the way, they'll say that out loud. But like last week when I said, let's go back and re-unpack assume breach. Same thing here. When we talk about, well, the human element is the most dangerous element. Well, let's make sure we back that up with our, you know, our architecture, acknowledging that risk and how we protect against it. While still, by the way, being very, very respectful and empathetic for people who have the hardest job in all of IT which is help desk. It's amazing that help desk is considered entry level to me because I think it is the hardest, most challenging uh, job there is. And, and by the way, if your organization is outsourcing this or there isn't a clear career path for help desk people to grow in your company, uh, you're, you're doing it wrong. These are the most talented um, people who have, you know, breadth of knowledge across your entire organization and all of the different tools and all the line of business apps and all the business processes and all the different orgs, they get it. If you aren't identifying the talent in your help desk and nurturing it and, and growing it into your IT org, you are doing it wrong. And so that's, again, I'll get off my soapbox here, but something I believe really, really strongly, I see organizations like outsource it or they, they don't nurture and grow this talent. And we've talked many times about the talent gap in cybersecurity. My goodness, here is your talent pipeline. It's your help desk. You can go and, and, and find talent there in a heartbeat. And if you're not, hopefully somebody else in your IT org is, but um, just, just another call out there as we go through the conversation as well. So uh, I'll get off my soapbox and we'll continue on with this discussion of securing the help desk, but uh, um, definitely have some strong feelings on this as, as uh, my first IT job was help desk. So maybe that's why I feel strongly about it. Mine was too. I moved from the help desk to cybersecurity and I think it is a great career path. So definitely look into what Adam is saying because that is a huge source. In fact, at my previous company, one of the guys that I mentored that actually got a cybersecurity analyst position was from the help desk. So I advocated for him. I mentored him. And then he is doing really well at that company now as a, as an analyst with his first cybersecurity job. So um, also I want to mention before we move on, don't overthink self-service password reset. I know a lot of times organizations start to, think about, oh, what's the impact to our our users and they're not going to understand it and we're going to have to come up with documentation and communication and send all that stuff out, the stuff that keeps project managers employed, which, by the way, I do love project managers. They are amazing when it comes to a specific project and you need them to do that stuff, but I would not overthink this particular project. Test it with a certain group of people, turn it on, and go. Because take, for example... Google, if I need to reset my Google password, it's actually pretty difficult, but nobody calls into a help desk. You don't call Google. There's zero chance to talk to a live person to reset your Google password. Give it a try because it, it doesn't happen. You can't do it. Uh, the only way to do it is through like another trusted device that you're signed into with multi-factor or a phone number that you initially opened that Google account with. Like there's some sort of check that they do, which is the same thing as most 
good self-service password reset solutions will do. They'll have either you send a, a signal to a, an authenticator app or a phone call or a text or a, a code to a specific email or a combination of all of those things. And in fact, if you haven't reset your Google password in a long time and you do it, they're going to challenge you for all the things. And so users are used to that. I mean, if you forget your password on a specific site, you click the forgot password link and it does something, right? Either sends you a temporary link somewhere or a code to a phone number or whatever it is. So don't underestimate your users. Everyone in this age has experience with technology. This shouldn't be something that you overthink. I would take a look at what you have. Like Adam said, Azure AD Premium P1, that comes with self-service password reset. You don't need to go out and buy a third-party product. If you're using another IDP like Okta or something like that, they also have self-service password reset built in. Most IDPs have this capability. I would turn it on. So if you are still resetting passwords manually, which you will, like we said, have to do even if you turn this on because maybe someone's having trouble. How have you thought about authenticating that user prior to resetting the password? There has to be some sort of thing that you're doing and it shouldn't be like, what's your corporate email address? Because we can look that up. You should have some sort of sensitive information. But again, if you do, you want to try to limit how sensitive it is, but something that is enough for that help desk member to validate, you know, what their identity is prior to resetting the password. But also think about this. If you're asking a particular security question, like let's say I put in, I don't know what my favorite food is, and that's in a spreadsheet somewhere or some sort of database and Adam calls in and I ask him, okay, what's your favorite food or what hometown did you get married in or something like that? Adam answers, and now I know the answer to his particular question, right? And so that's also a risk as well because you want to validate the identity of the caller, but you also, again, want to try to limit the amount of information that your help desk member or technician has access to and can retain. So think about how you're going to do that because there has to be some sort of method of authentication manually. Then, of course, if you are resetting the password, you have to provide that password to the caller. How do you do that securely? Ideally, we're setting random characters and numbers and symbols, but that gets pretty complicated to give over the phone. We did a password hacking episode a couple of weeks ago, and we kind of mentioned that eight characters, nine characters is kind of the the tipping point of where you should be at at least to prevent brute forcing of that particular password. So at least let's say for argument's sake, we do eight characters. If it's alphanumeric with symbols, you're saying this over the phone. Most likely people are going to take the path of least resistance and they're going to set it to something easy, like your company one exclamation mark or something like that because it's temporary, right? Ideally you set it so that that person can reset it again so that they have a password that they set. Don't let them tell you the password that they're going to set it to and then set it in there. That's, that's the worst way to do it because then the help desk person knows the password. So you have to provide a way to do that securely and the, you shouldn't send it to an email. You shouldn't put it in the service ticket or whatever it is. I mean, there should be a way to securely provide that password to that user. And ideally have them change it immediately. But then that, of course, opens up other things if you're not doing like some sort of modern management. Adam mentioned that self-service password reset on the window screen. You know, that requires um, modern management of Windows devices, right? And so if you're doing domain joined machines and you reset a password over the phone, well, that machine needs to have line of sight to the domain controller, it needs to cache those credentials before the user can log in. If you're using an IDP to do it, 
you know, that will flow if you're having, like, say, password write back enabled. It'll write the password back to AD. But again, that password still has to get over to the machine if it's a Windows machine. And hopefully you're not doing some sort of crazy thing like binding Mac computers to your Active Directory. Because if you do that, then you're going to, uh, you're going to have keychain issues if you reset passwords. If you've worked at a help desk before and you worked at an organization that binds Macs to uh, AD, you'll understand what I'm talking about and the user will have even more problems. So those are just some of the things to keep in mind when you're authenticating users. You okay over there, Adam? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> any, any any thoughts on that? <laughs> I thought I heard somebody like knocking on my window, and it's like a uh, egress window. So it was kind of just like, did I hear something? Like, what, what was that? I don't know. Uh, it, these are all good questions to ask on how we validate the identity of the caller, how we share the password with them. They're, they're hard things to solve. And I think that's why in a lot of cases, if you have an SSPR in place, a self-service password reset, uh, maybe the simplest answer is your help desk should try, if at all possible, to walk the user through using that tool. And if they can't use it, resolving that. Because like, if it's like, well, they don't have their computer in front of them, then what, where are they putting their password in anyway? <laughs> you know, like stuff like that are great questions to ask. So ultimately teaching the user to fish is, and not P-H-I-S-H, but F-I-S-H, like the, the saying, uh, is probably the most helpful way to go about it. So um, lots of good questions here and, and maybe an opportunity where you just kind of need a tool to help with this because a lot of these practices are risky but as as with anything in security it's it's understanding and managing your risk um i think there's ways to have have good audit trails for a lot of these and that might be sufficient for your needs as well so lots of good things to consider and i'm sure there is you know in a perfect world a way that the help desk technician could validate the user's identity without ever seeing any of the user's details and then they could reset their password and transmit it like telepathically to the user's brain or something. But like, these are all the problems with passwords. These are why passwords stink. Um, and I think that might lead us into our next topic here in a moment where we just talk about what if we just didn't have passwords and what that might look like. So good call outs here. I know passwords aren't going away tomorrow, so we need to manage this the best we can. But, um, you know, I, I'm always conscientious too of, Let's not put too much time into like making passwords better. Let's put our effort into getting rid of passwords. And so there's that trade-off too to consider is uh, how much time are you putting into a, a legacy security solution that we all agree needs to go away. I absolutely love that call out that you had about troubleshooting the self-service password reset with the user versus just resetting the password. Because if you have that in place, then yeah, just try to walk the user through that. And that's something I didn't think about, but that's just, you know, having another person here and talking through it and having a different idea. Yeah. Well, and I was kind of thinking through that as you were talking through this, I'm like, well, the best way to do that is to make the user do SSPR because it doesn't have those risks associated with it. And I think in most scenarios when I've had people say, well, the help desk is still going to have scenarios to reset passwords and people start throwing these bonkers off the wall scenarios where they would need it. In most of those scenarios, it's like you've bigger issues, you know, you've got bigger problems and the help desk can solve those. And then they can go back to the self-service password reset anyway. Um, when you get down to it, like the scenarios where it's like, well, what if they don't have connectivity? Well, then they don't need their password right now. You know, stuff like that. Like anytime you can come up with, well, what if this happened? It's like, then they don't need their password because it's broken. So uh, anyhow, I, that that's what kind of has occurred to me is having these conversations with customers before on, on some of the wacky ideas they bring to you. Because um, one of the things I love about my job is getting exposed to scenarios I didn't think about. And, and in sometimes kind of putting those through and thinking, yeah, why, why is it engineered that way? And then the answer a lot of times is because you couldn't use it anyway, or because it wouldn't work anyway, 
in the scenario you're describing. People will come up with these bonkers stuff and it's like, yeah, nobody's doing anything. Like I remember, so I'll give you an example. Uh, three companies ago, four before Microsoft, um, we are looking at migrating away from Lotus Notes and possibly going to what was like brand new at the time, Office 365, like had just been rebranded from BPAWS. And I remember the administrators at the time, and again, this is early days of the cloud, their objection was, but what if the internet connection goes down in the office? You know, then you can't get to your email anymore. And it's like, if it's on-premises, then you can still get to email. And it's like, dude, if the internet goes down at the office, everyone's going home. Like, you know, nobody's going to hang around the office with no internet connectivity. They're going to go take their laptop home and VPN in and work from there or whatever. But like this, this whole idea of, well, we could still get email, like, great. That doesn't matter. Like who cares? And so there's a lot of scenarios like that, where I, I would imagine stuff like this happens as well, as well, where people will talk about, you know, SSPR and come up with these goofy scenarios where you couldn't use it. And in most of those, the, the real answer is, well, you don't really need the password right now anyway. So anyhow, great call outs and all this stuff. And, and yes, obviously one of the things I love about doing the show is bouncing ideas off of each other and saying, well, did you think about this? Cause that might work too. So, so I think in an ideal world, we have this zero trust password reset model, right? Like you said, uh, either through telepathy or some sort of <laughs> crazy method like that. But what Adam and I are huge fans of is just moving to a passwordless world. If you have a, like a zero trust model and you're trying to do something, you know, imagine, for example, this scenario, like the help desk member needs to do something to validate the caller's ID. But then rather than asking for a security question, they can ask the caller to provide maybe the last three letters or something like that to the question. And that way the member's never really given a complete answer or the user may be asked to validate their identity through a code sent to their phone or something else. That's often like if you're calling uh, like a credit card provider, I know that with some of the bank institutions, when you call in, they'll send a code to your phone and then they validate that, that code. Um, and so that's another method that is out there today. Um, but sometimes that requires a third party tool to do that. Um, but also in that scenario, again, the, even if you've authenticated, you're still providing the technician the ability to reset the password. So in a true zero trust model, you're not able to do that. The technician shouldn't be able to reset the password. So, I don't think this is really possible, especially with on-prem AD without some sort of third-party tool. Um, there's a couple out there. Uh, one of the ones I came across was Spec Ops Secure Service Desk. But like Adam said, you know, trying to spend money and energy into legacy systems, I think what drives a lot of organizations away from a just implementing self-service password reset with a cloud identity provider is the fact that they're still using legacy methods of managing their devices, which are required to log into using those usernames and passwords. Now, if it's just single sign-on Azure AD or Okta or whatever application, SaaS applications that you're signing into, yeah, self-service password reset, turn it on. It's super easy. But if you're using domain joined Windows machines or, God forbid, AD-bound Mac devices, then you're going to run into issues with self-service password reset because you're going to reset those passwords using a cloud solution, a cloud IDP. Then that has to translate over to on-prem AD, then flow to the device itself. And that requires the device to have connectivity and then also the user to cache those credentials, which requires the old password to do that. Those are all true challenges of what happens when companies try to implement self-service password reset. So to solve for that, you should try to move to a modern management. And that's one of my call outs here is if you're going to do passwordless, 
you got to also do modern management. And that means trying to move to Azure AD joint devices. That way you're authenticating through Azure AD and not on-prem AD to those Windows devices. And then use something like Intune or Jamf or maybe like Jamf Connect or no, no more AD, Nomad, to authenticate to your Mac devices instead of binding them to AD. So do that because that will start your path and then you can move as long as you're authenticating to Azure AD, then you can do all of your authentication and self-service password reset and passwordless solutions all in the cloud, right? And so sign in with Windows Hello for Business. We talked about that last week with the new Cloud Trust key model where you are, it does require the initial line of sight, at least for a hybrid Azure AD joint, but then it doesn't after that. And if you're using Azure AD joint, you never have to talk to an on-prem domain controller for that Windows machine. Then there's the Authenticator app. You can turn this on as a passwordless solution. The user can register that device as a passwordless solution and just use the app to sign in. And then we even have, as far as Microsoft goes from Azure AD, something called a temporary access pass code that you can provide to users before they sign in. So if you have a new employee and you need to get them their initial password, you don't have to give them their password and then have them reset it. You can actually send them something called the temporary access code. And then that walks them through the whole setup for a passwordless solution. They'll have them register their device as an MFA device and walk through that. So you never have to give them an actual password and that temporary access code can expire after a certain period of time. So those are all different things as far as like for, at least for Azure AD, if you're a Microsoft customer, other IDPs will have different solutions as far as this goes, but most IDPs, at least at this point, have some sort of passwordless method of authentication, but specifically for Windows, and that as most companies are using Windows devices, right, try to get to the modern management because that that is a pain point for sure that I've encountered for a lot of organizations. As I've said many times on this show, the only way to get to passwordless is and get rid of passwords is to have those credible passwordless alternatives. And in your organization, the only way you're going to vet them is by using them. And not just in IT. Not just in IT. That happens all the time. It's like, oh, IT is piloting this. Well, great. You got anybody in the business piloting it? Because they're going to tell you, they're going to blow all the holes in you know what you need yet to make it happen and get it done. And this train's a common uh, for Microsoft consumer accounts, which are called MSAs, Microsoft accounts that you use for like Skype, consumer, Xbox, M365 for families. Those accounts today, now, you can go in there and say, remove my password. So my Microsoft account does not have a password. It has been deleted from the MSA service. It had one at one point in time. It no longer does. We have said publicly at Microsoft, that's coming this year to Azure AD accounts. It will happen this calendar year that you can have an Azure AD account that literally does not have a password. So this is this is something we've been talking about for a long time. It's not a flying car. It's a real thing. And so a lot of the challenges we're talking about, they go away when you get to a passwordless model. Now, passwordless you know, has its own set of challenges, right? You need to set up multiple factors that you can use to authenticate. Um, and then even those temporary access pass, that's what it's for is, is in a scenario like the user leaves their Yubi key at home, which is their FIDO2 key. Okay, we'll issue a temporary access pass for today um, or, or figure out some other option to get them signed in, perhaps authenticate or app on their phone as an example. So you know, this is this is where you need to test this and give feedback to your identity provider. Uh, all of them are doing various passwordless implementations. But again, sitting on the sidelines here just means this, this solution is going to be built without your input. And you're going to be a laggard as opposed to a leader. And so this is a great opportunity. I think as far as like wrapping up the show, you know, as some of the takeaways and we're talking about securing the help desk here, 
a lot of this big concern was around passwords. So if you get rid of passwords, a lot of this concern goes away. But I also think, um, you know, there's there's kind of a broader story here as well. And so we're, we're highlighting that. And, and then one last call out here, just going a little bit farther back into our discussion. We talked about where potentially a malicious help desk administrator could reset a privileged account and use that to essentially escalate their permissions or privileges. So at least in Azure AD, I can tell you that there are two different roles that have access to performing password resets. And in one role, you can only reset other non-privileged users. Then there's an entirely separate role that can only reset passwords of other privileged users. And I believe only global admins can reset the passwords of other global admins. So that's all kind of built in the service, at least from an Azure AD perspective, that prevents uh, privilege escalation through password resets, like climbing climbing the ladder there um, and resetting progressively more privileged accounts to get to where I want to be. Uh, there, there are actual ceilings in place that prevent you with this account from resetting the password of an account that is more privileged than you do. So that's helpful as well from an Azure AD perspective. It doesn't cover everything, but just know that is in place and does prevent um, at least that opportunity for privilege escalation. So, um, and then just as I guess my parting thought, uh, again, love the help desk, love thy help desk and uh, empower them to be successful, right? This, the, the premise of this show and, and this should be loud and clear to anybody who's who's listened to us for many years now, or the last year and a half, I should say, it was not like go strip all the permissions from your help desk and make them just in time escalate to everything and slow their processes down because you don't trust them and you shouldn't trust them. That was not at all the message of this show. This was let's empower them to be secure and productive. Um, let's think about some smart ways we can limit some of the risk inherent with doing password resets and, and put those in where appropriate. And then as opposed to investing a ton of time, effort, and attention on trying to further secure passwords, which is, you know, like fetch, it's never going to happen. Um, you can instead look at, look to the future, like password lists instead. So that's just kind of sum up. I, I didn't want anybody to take the wrong message away from this because certainly that was not our intent. And, and I think that came across loud and clear with like my soapbox rant on help desk people are an awesome uh, uh, talent pipeline for cybersecurity as well as other IT functions. Um, but again, you know, this is, this is an opportunity where there is some risk. So let's mitigate that risk and then let's look to the future. Great summary, Adam. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or topics you want us to talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAWZERO and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.